Well, the author Stephanie Land became an overnight sensation with her debut memoir, Made. A long, hard look at her impoverished beginnings and the trial she faced as a single parent. The book became a bestseller and was turned into a hugely successful Netflix series. We covered that, incidentally, here on the show. Well, now Land is back with a sequel called Class, which digs into how her struggles didn't end once she got into college, which is where Maid ended. In fact, many things even became harder. She tells Michelle Martin about it all. This conversation is part of our ongoing initiative about poverty, jobs, and economic opportunity in America called Chasing the Dream. Thanks, Bianca. Stephanie Land, thanks so much for talking to us. Thank you. It's good to see you again. Yeah, likewise. You know, I was thinking about your last book, Made. It made huge waves. I mean, it was a New York Times bestseller. It led to this Netflix series that, you know, at the time, one of the most successful series that they'd ever had. And I just, you know, I was thinking about it and going back to the book, and it ends with, you know, what you'd think is the Hollywood ending. You get to go to college, which has had been your dream, but it kind of wasn't. So why wasn't it that Hollywood ending that we all thought it was going to be? Well, I uh, made did end on a kind of literal high note. You know, we climbed up a mountain and and had this like joyous moment. And over the years, people have said, like, I'm so glad that you had your happy ending. And I just kind of thought like, oh, it got kind of really hard after that. Uh, and it was simply because I I had to go to class in person. Uh, and so, of course, that limited the amount of hours that I could work. Um, and government assistance programs don't count the hours that you spend in class as work for work requirements. So um so the the amount of assistance that I was getting for food and housing and everything um, was diminished because of that. You know, the, the story picks up with you moving to Missoula, Montana, with your then four-year-old daughter, you call Amelia. So one of the things that's a through line between this book and your previous book is just how precarious it all is, even when you're doing what everybody says is the right thing to do, Right. So just kind of walk us through it, just from the very beginning, when you're trying to, say, enroll, for example. Talk a little bit about that. Well, uh, the thing that I immediately was surprised by was I thought um, the residency, you know, how Mm -hmm. you get a smaller amount of tuition if you're a resident um, of the town where the school is. Um, I thought that because I had completely moved my whole entire life there, then that made me an immediate resident. Um, but that wasn't the case. So I had to um, prove that I was a resident over a year before I would get the decreased tuition. I think what I really didn't realize would be such a huge need would be um, the child care. Um, the the classes, you know, they they tried to make them, you know, kind of blend together so I could group them into two days a week or something, and then I could work Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But a lot of my classes went into the evening and and that required a babysitter because that was after daycare hours or or public school hours. Uh, and and that was most of my stress was just making sure that someone was taking care of my daughter while I was in a class that I was required to attend. And then there's also the question of the grant. Now, I think people are aware because it's been very much in the news and because so many people are affected by it, just how much debt people can get into trying to finish a degree, a degree that you know many people need just to function in this economy. Yeah, um, so I, re- I did receive a full Pell Grant um, and I had a small um, tuition that came out to be about um, $2,000 a semester. Um, and I, I did take out the maximum amount of loans. And what the loans actually went to um, was my living expenses. So it came out to be about $1,000 a month um, that I budgeted for um, very heavily. And um, and so when I graduated school, even though I'd only taken out loans for, I think, the last two and a half years of school, um, I, I was forty five to fifty thousand dollars in debt just just from that. What made you write this book? The part of this story that I think is the most meaningful to me in just how it has affected me 
as as a person as a human being was um i i was i was kicked off of food stamps because i could not meet the work requirements um i needed to work 20 hours a week while going to school full time in order to receive food stamps um because my daughter was over 6 years old uh and and that that really um that's something i still struggle with today is is just feeling like i somehow don't deserve food if I can't work enough for it. You know, I remember when uh, those work requirements were being debated, as they have been, you know, off and on th through the last, you know, couple of decades, that kind of concept in the modern era came in during the Clinton administration. You know, you write a lot about that. You said that all government assistance programs operated on the assumption that every person who walked into their office brought with them the possibility of scamming them in some way. We were asked detailed questions about our assets, what kind of car we drove, or if we had a burial plot, not because the government cared, but to determine if there was money hidden that we didn't disclose. It was ridiculous to imagine that anyone would try to pull a fast one by spending hours at a government assistance office in the middle of the workday so they could possibly leave with a couple hundred bucks a month for food. But this was how I spent hours and sometimes entire workdays of my life convincing authorities that I wasn't a criminal. These invasions of privacy caused me to fidget and squirm, but I submitted to them like everything else because it was another means to an end. Do you remember when it occurred to you that that's kind of what it, what it was? It's almost like they don't want you to have it or that they assume you're trying to sort of get one over on them. I think over the years, you know, I, I've been off of food stamps since early 2016. And I have been writing about it and paying attention to, you know, the conversations around it, especially in the media. And um, I, I just, I've noticed a, a trend that I, I think that they make it harder so that less people sign up. Um, and, and there's two reasons for that, I think, is, you know, the states receive block grants. And if those grants aren't used, then they can use them for other things things. And the less people who sign up, then the more progress is being made and, and things are better. And, you know, see, we don't even need these programs. And, and, and there's always the, the, um, the welfare to work thing, you know, you, you mentioned Bill Clinton and, and welfare reform, and, and that has been the assumption since the beginning of of welfare programs, it seems, is is the people who are on government assistance programs are choosing not to work, and and that is hardly ever the case. Most of the families who are on food stamps are are working um, multiple jobs sometimes. The other through line of the book and of is this whole question of what you deserve. Like, do you deserve to go to college? Like, do you deserve to do work that you want to do as opposed to work that you have to do or that you are worthy or if you're only worthy because you're working. Could you talk a little bit more about that and what that feeling is and why you think it's so pervasive? Um, it, it really felt like um, not only did I not deserve to be there, like I never felt deserving of higher education. I never felt entitled to it. Um, it to me, it felt like I I was taking up space. I mean, I, I felt like I was um, not just an imposter, but like I was there on a grant. You know, like I couldn't fully participate in a lot of the college atmosphere. You know, like I couldn't hang out with friends. I couldn't go to the outside of class activities that a lot of the other students were going to. Um, and not just the pizza parties, like the, you know, the, the, um, the readings of authors that were visiting in town and, um, things that a lot of people who were in my degree program were going to. Um, and, and I just, you know, I was 10 years older than most of the people in my class and, and, very much felt out of place and like I didn't belong. Um, I really felt apologetic if I needed to take up my professor's time um, because I just, I felt like, you know, being on government assistance and, and already receiving so much help in that way, like it, I think it just messed with me a lot. And, and I just felt like 
I shouldn't ask for more help because I was already getting a lot that other people weren't. Um, you know, and I, I think there's, there's a thing when, when you are hungry and, and you don't have enough money to feed yourself to the point where you are satiated, um, it, it really affects you and you, you hide from people. And, and I, I did my best to hide that. It was, it was, it was embarrassing, um, to, to not have enough money. You do write about kind of the judgment that you get from a lot of different people, including family members. I'm just sort of puzzled by why it is that so few people seem to be willing to let you dream. And I'm just wondering why you think that might be. It was, you know, dreams don't pay that much. Um, and and it takes a lot to succeed, um, especially in the arts. Um, and so it, there was no guarantee. There was no job at the end of it. There, you know, even my classes in college didn't teach me how to make money as a writer. And, and so there was really, um, this question of like, you're doing what you're getting a degree in English. What are you going to do with that? And, and so it was very much this, like, um, I needed to be on a path where employment and health benefits and all of that was at the end. I can have an awkward question, but again, you're kind of, your, your, your brand is honesty, right? The decision to have a second child when you were already struggling to be the parent you wanted to be to your first. You talk about that in the book. Will you talk about that? Because that is something that I think where people feel entitled to judge, right? I mean, they feel entitled to judge. And so I wanted to ask if you would just talk about that, how how you came to the decision that you were going to go and have a second child, even though it was already hard to have one. Well, I mean, it wasn't a planned thing. Um, it, it wasn't, you know, I I was purposefully trying, um, but I discovered I was I was pregnant, and um, and I have always wanted my oldest to have a sibling. You know, I grew up with a little brother, and um, she was always asking for a little sister. Like she asked for a sandwich for lunch, and and so it was just this. Uh, it was something I wanted and, and I have experienced so much judgment from that, mm -hmm. um, just because of my economic status at the time. Um, and you know, that's, that's very, that's a very unique sort of judgment for people who are poor. Um, mm -hmm. and I, and so like, I, for me, it's been a conversation that I've just kind of had over the years, but um, lately it's just been this, uh, since I've been doing so many interviews, um, it's just like, well, why why can't I choose to have a child? Um, in writing the book, though, you know, I wrote the book right after the overturn of, of Roe v. Wade, and and I I really wanted to show what it's like to have a child with absolutely no resources. Um, because for a lot of women or, you know, people who have a uterus, like if they can't get an abortion, then they suddenly have a child to take care of. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to receive a lot of resources because of that. I mean, there's still, it's very hard. And, and, and so, um, part of me really wanted to show what that it looks like too. Um, but for me, you know, I, I really wanted to have a baby. I wanted to have two children and mm -hmm. I was 35 and, you know, I was already considered like a geriatric pregnancy and stuff. And so mm -hmm. I thought my time was running out and, and that was the choice I made. I'm so interested in also your, how you feel you kind of changed between your first book and your second or have you? Oh, well, I mean, the, the voice and, and kind of my character are, are very different between the first book and the second, you know, the first book, I wrote it in a very apologetic, you know, please, sir, can I have some more, you know, Oliver Twist type of character. And um, I felt apologetic for just 
being a person in that story, you know, for, for being a person who's on government assistance and, um, in writing the second book, uh, I, I discovered that I was pretty angry about what I had to go through. And I had the, I felt I had the platform, you know, I had the clout, I had the Netflix series and all of that, that I, I felt like it might be accepted to hear an angry woman, uh, write a whole book and talk about how angry she is about, about something. And a lot of that was because it's been 10 years since mm -hmm. I have been in that situation and I have a new sense of normalcy. Um, I have, um, a lot more privilege than I did then. And I still had privilege then just as a white person in that situation. But, um, now it's like to go back and and truly live in that time and absorb it and write about it and write from that space. Um, I, I couldn't believe that I had to go through that. And it, it made me angry. There are a lot of people who think we're in an even meaner time now than we were then. And I'm just wondering, like, how do you feel now? Do you still feel angry? Do you feel hopeful in any way? There was a time at the beginning of the pandemic that I did feel hope. <laughs> um, and and it, it it was really incredible to see so many people realizing, like even Biden tweeted that people didn't have a sick day. And all over the news were restaurant workers who suddenly couldn't pay rent because they had been out of work for two weeks. And mm -hmm. and we called workers, workers essential, um, which I thought was kind of sad, to be honest, because, you know, those were people who could not afford to not go to work and and they were also forced to go to work in the pandemic um but there was just this moment of like oh my goodness these people they need help we need to help them um and you had the unemployment in expansion you had the child tax credit expansion you had um all of these programs um begin and then they ended and everybody went back into poverty and, and, you know, we were able to show how much uh, poor people actually do benefit from having some money and, and then it disappeared again. And, and I, I think, you know, at the crux of all of this is, you know, the, the American bootstrap myth, you know, if you work hard enough, then you're going to make it. And so if you're not making it, then you're not working hard enough. Um, but there's also just this, um, we don't trust poor people with money. And, mm. and we don't think that they deserve nice things. And, and I, when, when all of those arguments start up again, you know, when people start crying about work requirements and, um, and how we can't just give people a free lunch and, and they need to work for it first, like, that's that's the basis of that argument is is a belief that poor people just can't have nice things. Stephanie Land, thank you so much for talking with us again. Thank you. I, I can't wait until we get to talk again.